Welcome, we are the Ministry of the Real Truth. Today we are going to have another look at the book The Old Testament Light by Aramaic translator George Lampsart. Old Testament light, a scriptural commentary based on the Aramaic of the ancient Peshitta text, that would be the original ancient Eastern Syriac Peshitta, translated by George M. Lamsa, a native born Aramaic speaking translator. From Syria. Table of Contents. Introduction. Throughout the centuries, many have written commentaries on the greatest of all books. The Bible, scholars of all races and colors have, in one way or another, tried to throw light on the Bible, and yet today people are more eager than ever to understand the book that contains life, light, and truth. This commentary is in this book. It's based on the Aramaic language and the ancient biblical customs and manners which played an important part in recording God's holy word. The Aramaic word for commentary is nohara, to throw light or to enlighten. In the olden days, because of the fact that words and phrases had several meanings, all important state or royal decrees, treaties and agreements contained marginal explanations or commentaries in order not to leave any doubt in the mind of the reader. Ezra 4.7 the purpose of this nohara or commentary is to throw light on obscure passages in Bible translations to correct the words which have been mistranslated and thus to recover the lost meanings, meaning of the verses to explain biblical idioms, metaphors, allegories, customs and manners which in the ancient context are difficult and unfamiliar to Western minds. But simple for the Easterners to understand. After all, the Old Testament was written in first in Semitic languages for Semitic people centuries before Greek, Latin and present European languages were born. The New Testament was written for the descendants of the same people. And the authors of the sacred literature were moved by the Holy Spirit. They lived in a world of unseen realities. The Western Bible translators and commentators have done their best in translating ideas from the ancient languages and the style of writing in which they were first written and preached into one expressive and changing languages of our days. This is not a verse by verse commentary. Hundreds of comments which have been written on the obscure passages and mistranslations have been clarified through a direct translation from the ancient Aramaic Peshitta. Peshitta means clear, sincere, straight to an original. The writings were called Peshitta because they were clear in the original setting. Text. The clear, the simple, the true text. This is a book for the ministers, students of the Bible and laymen who are eager to understand the meaning of the scripture and the ancient customs and manners which constitute the background of the sacred book. Some of the comments are answers to hundreds of letters which come from sincere men and women. And it continues. Chapter 1 Genesis Introduction Genesis is the first book of the Pentateuch, or Pentateuch a Greek translation of the Aramaic or biblical term Kamsha Sapre de Moshe, the five books of Moses. They are also called Torah, the law, or the books of the law of Moses. Genesis in Aramaic is Barita, the creation, even though the primary objective of the author of it is to give the Jewish history of their ancestors. He included in his work an account of the creation of heaven and earth and all that are therein. This was necessary in order to give the genealogies of the patriarchs and of Abraham, the father and founder of the Hebrew race, and to picture their ancestral and cultural background in their language and religion. The author, George M. Lamser, traces Abraham's ancestry back. Okay, it may actually be talking about the biblical author. The author traces Abraham's ancestry back to Adam and to the divine promises which God made to Eve, Genesis 3.15. Evidently, some of the portions of the book of Genesis were handed down orally. 
Others were written during the time of Moses. The whole work was guided by a divine revelation in God's inspiration. The author's aim was not to explain God's creation from a scientific point of view, but to give his people an idea that the Lord God of Israel was the creator of the heavens and the earth, and that the pagan gods could not create, and therefore were false gods created by men. There are two accounts of the creation in the book of Genesis. The first is a spiritual account. God acted as a God, creating everything by his command. The second is an explanation or a commentary on the first. For many centuries, the two accounts of the creation and other sacred materials were handed down on separate scrolls or tablets, and only after many years were they combined into a single work. Moreover, some of these accounts were written by different scribes. Marginal notes were often incorporated into the text and copied by later scribes. For example, the prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended, Psalm 72.20. This note was written to facilitate the reading of the book. The burden of Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, did see, Isaiah 13.1. The burden of Moab, Isaiah 15.1. The burden of Damascus, Isaiah 17, one, and many other such instances are scribal notes which were copied into the book. Eternity. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Genesis 1 1. Well, in the translation of the original manuscripts by Victor N. Alexander, the Brita, in the Brita, from the Ishana Atika Sapraya, the language of God, which he spoke to Adam and Eve in the garden. It actually says, in the beginning, the Muta, or the manifestation of God, created the heaven and the earth. Who is that manifestation? He who was hidden, not yet revealed, and then revealed. Later known as Yeshua Meshika, Yeshua Meshika, or Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah, created all. In the beginning, as the beginning, he created all. This should read, God created the heavens and the earth in the very beginning. God is the subject of the sentence, and the heavens and the earth are objects. The author states that the heavens and the earth were created from the very beginning. That is before the sun and the moon and the stars were created. In other words, the heavens and the earth were created before time. God alone can reveal to man how and when heavens and earth were created. Some scientists place the age of the earth at 4 billion years. Human, humanly speaking, 4 billion years are eternity. Many aspects of the creation will remain a secret, which man will never be able to unlock or reveal. Neither Jesus Christ nor the Hebrew prophets tried to explain the mystery of the creation, but they believe that God created them and that God can destroy them if he wishes. It actually goes against the letter Christian apologetics where uh, the earth is young and then around about 6,000 years to 8,000 years old because of certain words found in the Brita of the original Aramaic, original ancient very old Aramaic word Iuma which means Measurable period or unfathomable period, era, eon, age, day with the capital D. Very, very different to your common Christian understanding, or common Christian understanding, or even Jewish, modern Israel, etc. Judaism of it being a virtual or literal six day rest on seventh day week essence without form and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters Genesis 1-2 the earth may have suffered some ca catastrophic disturbances as a result of inner stresses such as volcanic eruptions and earthquakes the surface of the moon reveals such marks of volcanic disturbances be that as it may seemingly the earth was devoid of the forces and equilibrium which make order and life possible so from chaos came order the first order might have been overthrown just as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah Aramaic Amora in the days of Abraham moreover the formless matter may have been in existence ages before order and life appeared upon the face of the earth 
the creation of the firmament, the sun, moon, star, and stars, make order and time and life possible. In other words, we may conclude that at the outset the earth was not capable of producing life and it lacked precision and harmony. Behold, the Lord shall destroy the earth and lay it waste and turn it upside down and scatter its inhabitants. Isaiah 24 1. I beheld the earth and lo, it was without form and void in the heavens and they had no light. Jeremiah 4.23 because he had that vision of what the earth was like at one point it was beautiful etc and then some catastrophic event occurred for whatever reason and God destroyed it the or laid waste of it the Aramaic word yath means essence being existence and substance Hebrew is eth the Greek is ausia in English it implying the origin of substance of the thing According to the Eastern text, God first created the essence of the heaven and the earth and the physical with the material form and order came later. This indicates that the essence of heaven and earth existed from the very beginning. God was always manifested through his spiritual creations out of which the terrestrial creation came into being. The second verse literally reads, And the earth was or came to be without form and void. That is to say, empty or desolate, nothing but confusion and chaos. But the essence or the creative force was there. The Aramaic top of bo, he boho in Arabic bahia means emptiness. That is empty of form but not lacking in essence. The essence is spiritual, eternal and indestructible. Temporary and destructible and depends on the essence which governs it. Light. In God said let there be light and there was light. Genesis 1 3. Bahra shining light in this instant means enlightenment. This is the light in the knowledge of God and moral law. Darkness in Aramaic is symbolical of ignorance, superstition and evil. For many centuries man felt the presence of God or of a great governing force, but he knew little or nothing about his being, the natural forces around him and the moral law. The author of Genesis tells us that the sun was created on the fourth day and yet there was evening and morning on the previous days. Thus, first day or second day means a unit of time or period based on the then seven known planets. The sun was created on the fourth day after the trees and grass were created. So again, the author of Genesis tells us that the sun was created on the fourth day, and yet there were evening and morning on the previous days. Thus, first day or second day means a unit of time. So that could be in relation to the Aramaic word Iyuma, which means um, the miserable period, era, eon, age, day with capital D. The sun was created on the fourth day after the trees and grass were created. So here a unit of time would mean there was no time, just infinite time, not no time as we know it, just infinite time and space. Then again, we must remember that the early man knew nothing about our present calendar of 365 days. Uh, the Egyptians supposedly created it. For many centuries, the moon served as the only yardstick for measuring time. No mad people still rely on the moon for their grazing and migrations. The Hebrews and the Muslims still use the lunar calendar. They not use the lunar solar calendar, whereas the Roman Catholics, etc., just use the lunar calendar. Or is it the solar? Yes, yeah, solar. They use the sun. It's based on the um, the calendar is based on the solar or the sun. Not a lunar solar. As the ancients said, the present calendar was developed only after man's scientific knowledge had advanced. That is, when the Babylonian Egyptian scientists discovered that the sun and not the earth was the centre of our solar system. That this this discovery was made more than twenty centuries BC, long before Abraham left Ur of Chaldea. Okay, and it goes basically through Genesis, the creation, time and seasons, 
time and seasons, and God said, Let there be light in the firmament of the heavens, to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days and years. Jesus 5.14. Prior to the creation of the heavens and earth, the time was non existent. Without the creation of the heavens and the earth, there would have been no events, no periods, no phases of the moon whereby to reckon time. Time and space came into existence during the creation. Time, days, and years were made by God for man's convenience. In God's eyes, a thousand years are but a, as yesterday. So, in His eyes, at that point, possibly, a day was like a thousand years. But to man, when man finally came along, the day was basically, let's say, if I can say, twelve hours of light, twelve hours of night. The psalmist says, A thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Psalms 94. That is, God, being from everlasting to everlasting, is not subject to time and space. So he wasn't looking at his wristwatch saying, Okay, six o'clock, uh, I need to uh, plant these trees, etc., etc., by uh, 6 p.m. Yeah. So, He's not subject to time or space or time and space. The term Zabni, Zabni, time here means periods. The term Atwata, signs, refers to the stars and planets which stand in the sky like landmarks on the earth. Shana, year is a unit of time. The Aramaic word for change is Shani. Shana denotes a change from one period or season to another. The biblical day was made up from, made up from sunset to sunset. According to the Hebrew calendar, a day is a period from one sunset to the next. Undoubtedly, this division of time was made after the sun was created and its movements studied by man. All of God's works were finished in six days. That's what he is saying. That's what those in the uh, it's what those Americanized English Bible versions are saying. But here. He says, note, the week is not mentioned in this account of creation. Weeks and other subdivisions in time were made later. Night watches and hours were not known until day and night were further divided and a first calendar was instituted. The first meaning, mention of a smaller unit of time occurs in the Bible during the time of King Ahaz. It was known as a degree on the sundial, 2 Kings 20.10. The term hour first occurs in Daniel 3.6. Seasons were familiar to man from the very beginning, just as they were familiar today to savage tribes and to the illiterate nomads who have little or no knowledge of calendars. They rely on the seasons to mark the passage of time. The sun, moon and stars were created for days, months and seasons, but it took man a long time to discover their movements. It took man many centuries before he discovered that the sun is the centre of the universe. In the ninth century after Christ, an Assyrian bishop, Ma Isha, wrote a book in which he warned the Christians against the teaching of the Chaldean astrologers that the sun is the centre of the universe. The Hebrews believed the earth was the centre. Dragons or sea monsters, and God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every wing fell after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Genesis 1.21 Tanina means dragon, metaphorically, a devil. It's metaphorical. But when used astronomically, it means the constellation Draco, one of the major constellations. The Aramaic word is Leviathan, a sea monster, and metaphorically a devil. Whale was used here by the King James translators simply because the whale was the only great sea monster with which they were familiar. image and God said let us two or more make man in our image which is obviously two or more after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth Genesis 126 so was he talking to say the Holy Spirit Rakh and Yeshua Mashika or the Son of God uh, etc or was he talking to the angels? We think, no, he wasn't. We don't believe that angels create. We haven't found anything that states 
the scripture that angels actually create. Nasha, man, is derived from the Aramaic word nishmitha, breath, that is the breath of life. Only in his spiritually, spirituality and his eternity is man the image of the likeness of God. That is, the breath of God, being spiritual and eternal, makes him spiritual and eternal. God does not create anything opposite or contrary to himself. God has no hands, feet or eyes, no flesh, neither does he sleep or walk as he has often been pitted. He is often reduced to human terms in order that man may understand him. And of course, because he's spirit, right? Originally spirit. In spiritual form, spirit form. So again, God does not create anything opposite or contrary to himself. God has no hands, and feet or eyes, no flesh, neither does he sleep or walk as he has often been pitted. He is often reduced to human terms in order that man may understand him. So perhaps people like John in Revelation who saw once seated on, seated on a throne, he saw his hands and his feet, etc., and his clothing, was able to see that to verify to him that God exists in the kingdom, right? In the heavens. Image in this instant means likeness or resemblance. God has been portrayed as having hands, eyes, ears, feet and nose in order that man may understand him in relation to himself. God's image is spiritual, that is characterized by intelligence and knowledge. Earthly man is temporal and mortal, but the spirit of God which dwells in him is immortal and real. Moreover, man is conscious of his creator and knows evil and good. None of God's other creatures are endowed with his knowledge, nor are they governed by moral law. Man, being in the image and the likeness of God, has power and dominion over all of God's creations. Adam. So God created man in his, man in his own image. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. This is plural there. It's Genesis 1.27. Created he him, male and female, created he them. So there's two genders, two sexes. He created one, a male, and two, a female. Or male and females. Males and females. In the preceding verse, the name of the man is called Nasha, derived from the Aramaic word Nishmatha. Breath, that is the breath of life, the spirit of God which dwells in man and which makes him in the image and the likeness of his creator. In verse 27, the term man is used collectively meaning humanity or mankind. Adam means red soil. That is a man formed out of the ground. According to the first chapter of Genesis, both Adam and Eve were created spiritually by the word of God just as he had created all other things. We just come to our mind that uh, possibly in the Brita, he doesn't actually... Maybe he does. He created Adam... The first Adam, the pre-Adamic, the Anathal man, and then he creates the second man, right? Adam, and then an Eve. Okay. Adam means red soil that is a man formed out of the ground. So yeah, this is a difference because the other, in the original, ancient, very old Brita of the Lishana, I think it's a prayer, was made in God's image of the ground or of the soil. According to the first chapter of Genesis, both Adam and Eve were created spiritually by the word of God, just as he had created all other things. In that term, word of God, it may be, mean the Milta, the manifestation of God, or Ishwar Mashiga, who is God. That is to say, the spiritual man was not formed out of the dust of the ground. Okay, for in the first chapter we read, God created man in his own image. Male and female created he them. God's image has nothing to do with the ground. The creation of man took place on the sixth day, and everything was perfect and good. In other words, man was the last of the creations to God of God. God blessed them and told them to multiply and gave them dominion over all his creatures, his creations. Thus the first chapter gives us a true picture of creation and of God as creator. Here God gives commands and everything is done according to his will. 
whereas in the second chapter God works with his hands like a man. The second account of the creation is a commentary on the first chapter. George M. Lancer believed it is the work of a later writer who tried to explain man's creation in a symbolical manner so that the people might understand it. This account is old and it has a spiritual value. It was placed next to the first chapter simply because it is a commentary on it. Some people believe the second account of the creation contradicts the first, but this is not true. The second account is written figuratively from the human point of view in order to explain the first account, which is spiritual and in which God works as God and not as man. The reader must remember that the Bible is a library containing hundreds of writings written at different times by different authors. No inspired Hebrew writer could have thought of God literally mixing soil and forming a man out of it. But Hebrew prophets often portray God as a man, planting vineyards or trees, or doing other manual work. Here's another seeds. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because he's saying that the first Adam created was God. In the spiritual, and the second Adam was. God the physical yeah, he has a very different understanding and outlook and conclusion to the man creation act by God compared to say Victor Alexander a native born Aramaic translator for Bethany or Mesopotamia Syria where he clearly through his translations shows that, that Brita agrees with the pre-Adamic or Neanderthal man of science, archaeology etc and then a another human being Adam or Adams were created which had that spirit of God within them so that they could parlay or be in commune or communion with God, walk and talk with God, whereas the Neanderthal man was just had he had uh, spirit, he had soul, but he didn't have the Rakakadesh with the spirit, so he just followed his natural animal instinct. And the only way back. Well, anyway, he could be like a human being, a real human being, was to accept Christ, or accept God, right? That would make him a whole human being. <laughs>